Hello, greetings, folks. How are you this evening? Very, very nice to see you indeed. And uh, as ever, all in, in good time. You're so regular, you lot. <laughs> <laughs> so discipline. Yes, hello, so, everybody. Uh, uh, I can only apologise if I'm a little bit grainy this evening. Don't know what's happening with my bandwidth, but um, it has been better. So keep our fingers crossed that it uh, yeah. that it hangs on in there. Yeah. So you're, you're very um, uh, uh, a, a bit jerky and uh, a bit echoey, but uh, we'll do what we can. Echoey as well. We'll well. It's sort of Dalek-y. You know, for those that know what that means. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Nevertheless, right. we shall uh, press on and it'll be a, a jolly fine evening because we had some jolly fine questions over the last uh, last month. And, uh, yeah, we have. Uh, uh, you know, before we go on, I have to say that we had quite a few more questions, I think, than it's fair for us, to, Rupert and I, to deal with in, in an evening. So... Uh, forgive us if uh, yeah. some of you missed out uh, on, with your questions this evening, and I know at least two of you <laughs> uh, <laughs> had uh, more than one question. So we, we are really being strict about uh, one one question yes. per person. I think I don't think anybody slipped yes. uh, slipped through. Uh, yes. <laughs> Dale, I'm, I'm looking. Not at sure you. about that. <laughs> oh, I was looking at Jimmy. <laughs> And him. <laughs> <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, before um, we kick off, um, of course, if you're here for the first time, we're speaking to you as if you're old friends, and a lot of you are, because you've been with us for uh, some time, not only just on YouTube here, but, of course, on, uh, on, on Patreon. So uh, if you are with us for the first time, please do um, uh, make a comment, let us know who you are and where in the world you are, because it's always fascinating to us to uh, find out just how dispersed <laughs> you are. Oh, no apology needed, it Dale. Is. It's the, Hello, we Bonnie. like the enthusiasm. Big hugs from the Netherlands. <laughs> take big hugs. Uh, always take big hugs. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so, what I was going to say, mm -hmm. uh, Rupert, uh, just a bit of um, housekeeping before we begin. I don't know, we must find another word for it. Housekeeping doesn't seem quite appropriate. Um, yeah, not to be about the bush. Um, I'm moving house now, uh, This back end of this month uh, and in into May. So, things are going to be not probably quite as much up to speed as far as YouTube is concerned over the next month. Uh, the next thing to expect, in fact, I think, is the next news item, which we'll be doing at the end of uh, this this month. Um, we'll do what we can, but just to say, uh, foot's off the pedal. I've got other matters to attend to. However, if you're not yet a, a Patreon member, uh, we'll be keeping the stuff on Patreon going, and there's loads more stuff to see there anyway. Um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as I was saying, Dale, I mean, for instance, you will get your, Dale, you will get your questions answered tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, it's, yes, you will. It's Friday, yeah. Friday feedback time in, uh, in Patreon, and we've, yeah. we've picked up on a couple of your questions, and from other folks. Jimmy, you may be in luck as well, who knows? Oh, no, you're not a Patreon, are you, Jimmy? Damn, sorry. Um, <laughs> um hint, hint. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the, the link for Patreon's down there below. As I say, there's loads more stuff there and a great bunch of people. Uh, that, and that's uh, you know not the least of it by, uh, by any means. And also, somebody later on will mention the Monday moot. So that's two things in a week sometimes that uh, you know, yeah. never sees the light of day uh, on, on YouTube. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, enough said about that. So yeah. I'm going to um, say a couple more hellos. Hello, Niels. Uh, more Dutch hugs from him. And I noticed that Bonnie, uh, yeah. who sent us the, uh, the the first set of hugs, in 11 days I'm leaving for... Uh, she's going to Gebekli Tepe. Wow. Fantastic. We'll, uh, we will await feedback. Good for yeah. you. Have a good time. Have a very good time indeed. Sure yeah. you will. Okay. I was just going to mention that uh, we, we've made a commitment as far as what the next film will be. Um, and the, we, when all settled, we're going to be getting out in the field and doing some filming in June. 
And we're doing a film about uh, the, the Long Barrows. I think it'll be called The Long Barrows, um, the megalithic tombs of the Seven Cotswold uh, area. And that's about, there's a fantastic story to tell uh, about those early ne Neolithic uh, monuments. Um, so, and that's what we'll, uh, we'll be doing. So, um, yeah, uh, we'll keep you up to date and... Uh, you know, as far as behind the scenes stuff is concerned, Patreon members get it before uh, first. So, anything more to add to what I have said, Mr. Soskin? Um, I don't think so. Other than we we all wish you Godspeed with your move. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and hope it's as painless as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, mm. There's there's a lot to do, but I won't uh, bore you with that. I'm just I'm just checking where the dog is. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's on the sofa downstairs, so we're safe there for the moment. <laughs> All right. Shall I, shall I, shall I bring us the... Um, uh, the... I've just seen that uh, that uh, James has joined us. Hello, James. Uh, it's good to see you. I actually sent James a question earlier on, and James replied just as we were going on air, saying he'd leap in for a chat. Unfortunately, James, I'd love to say yes, but we can't. We're doing this comes through a virtual studio, and we can't actually bring you into that. Um but uh, we must try that next time. Uh, yes. For those of you that don't know, it's not impossible, uh, though, with a bit of planning. It's not impossible to bring people mm -hmm. into into this with, with, with just a little bit of planning. Um, so, uh, just where am I? Oh, I see. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Rupert. We, is that what you wanted to say? Uh, uh, yes, but I was just going to uh, tell uh, everybody else things. Uh, you know, we've mentioned him specifically. That for those of you that don't know, uh, our friend uh, James, Doctor James Dilly, he uh, he runs oh. a, a website called Ancient Craft, and in fact, you, you can see him there in the chat if you uh, if you scroll oh. and find him. And uh, is uh, James here? James is an absolute demon when it comes to ancient crafts, uh, whether it's flint napping or Casting of, he's um, uh, yeah, he's extraordinary. Um, <laughs> so it's good to have you, James. Um, anyway, yes, um, I have okay. uh, I have nothing more to add at this stage. All right, I shall bring up the uh, the first question, which is from uh, James James uh, Bagby. Uh, Hello, James. Works. Hold on a second. There we go. And uh, James asking, uh, is asking what sort of rearranging of renovations of megalithic sites might have occurred in the Iron Age as so often happened in the Bronze? Have archaeologists discovered that a certain modification happened much later in the first millennium BCE than usual? Um, I, that, that's a, a truncation of the question, but I think I've got the pretty much got the gist of it there, uh, James. I'm presuming that you were referring to megalithic sites because uh, the only, they're the only ones really, you know, that uh, people have taken notice of uh, after their prime uh, purpose has uh, 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 maybe gone away. Have you got anything to say particularly about this one, Rupert, first, um, as far as... I do you know, I think the first comment I would make really is yeah. that something that uh, Mike and I have joked about before uh, is that archaeologists have this tendency, with all due respect to our friends amongst the archaeological fraternity, they do have this tendency to, to look at sites in the Neolithic and the Bronze Age and refer to them as ritual and ceremonial. And then as soon as it gets to the Iron Age, then they call them fasteds. Um, uh, there's no rationale for that other than the fact that uh, the more you get into the Iron Age, uh, the more fortified, the, particularly hilltop forts, uh, you know, the, the more recognisable they are. Uh, you know, they they speak more to us, they're more, uh, more of a familiar feel to them. Uh, but uh, not really. It's just where people lived. I think they tended to uh, uh, dig in more in the same way that anywhere that you look around the world, as, as time romps forwards, settlements get bigger, uh, you know, villages become towns, that sort of thing. And I think that one of the big changes that you could see happening in the Iron Age was the sizes of the settlements, you know, just because you get... Uh, 
a significant increase in numbers of population. Mm. It means that a, a certain amount of things become more entrenched, whether that's farming or uh, smithing, that sort of thing. You know that uh, that they become more apparent. I think in the um, in the archaeology, and I, I'm just thinking of everywhere that you can think of where you where you're looking at, uh, you know, fortifications in the Iron Age. Uh, I think that's probably the most significant difference that I could pull up. What would you think? Mm. Well, it's a question of what uh, James uh, means by uh, meddling. Um, I wasn't uh, clear on that. And, I, I've, and, and I've heard a different question than you have in, in, uh, in the question. And I was thinking more in terms of uh, more along the lines of the sort of things that went on at Stonehenge, where we know after it was completed for its original purpose, um, that after um, in 2500 and going, you know, 2004, 2003 uh, BC things are still happening to it, but not necessarily with its original purpose in mind because you've got a new set of people occupying the landscape around Wiltshire, um, the, the, the beaker culture, which uh, I can't imagine uh, had the same view of, of the Sarsen stones as the people who built them, frankly. Uh, and that's borne out. I've just finished reading Mike Pitt's uh, wonderful book about how to build Stonehenge. And one of the remarkable things that came out of that for me was realising how much vandalism took place. <laughs> it looks like that was what was occurring immediately after it was built. The, the, the evidence in the ground that it was degraded quite strongly. Uh, and it's quite a miracle that uh, a lot of it has survived because uh, people immediately started chipping away at it, particularly the blue stones. It has to, has to be said, the uh, sarsen is made of, of harder stuff. But it was, it was quite a shock to me. Uh, it, and, and actually, considering that this came out of uh, Tim Darville's 2008 investigation, you know, quite a small pit, that the the all that shows up is chip after chip of after chip. You know, it started a long time ago. This chipping, chipping away at uh, at Stonehenge, and you know, remaking it into something else, or uh, take, people taking souvenirs. It's uh, it's a, a story of the um, uh, of uh, uh, the the uh, was it the whispering? No, not the whispering knights. The king's man. The Kingstone, at, King's um, the Rollwright Stone, writ large. Well, the Kingstone, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, you, indeed. If you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, so that's mm. kind of, that's a long way of saying the kind of question I heard in, in James's question. But it also, yeah. from an archaeological point of view, that unless you query a site with that particular question in mind, you're not necessarily going to find the evidence to support Port or you know that that evidence is not going to leap out of your investigations unless mm -hmm. you de de deliberately approach the site with that query in mind. This mm. this is the thing about archaeology you 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 have to query it first. You you, don't, you can't just dig and expect sort of answers or surprises to come out. You, you've got to have a narrow uh, field, you know, a, a narrowish field of view. And to be querying it in certain ways and have questions that you want answered. And I don't think that is top of the list for archaeologists to find out whether later people were uh, knocking seven bells out of what, what had gone before, if you see what I mean. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's a longer discussion there, but um, th that was my take, and that's my uh, <laughs> probably more than you would. <laughs> Betting? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, J James has just said in the comments, "I'm happy with the way you're both approaching it." So, uh, so, so we'll just run with that. Nice one, James. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, cool. 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 Um, all right. Back. Oh God. It's a good Excuse job me. I know what I'm doing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, thank you, uh, James. Great uh, question, uh, Thecla. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, greetings to you. Are you with us tonight? Haven't seen you in the chat yet. Uh, hopefully you'll be watching this later, if not tonight. Anyway, Thekla asked, I could be completely off base here, but didn't people in both Scarabray and Katalhoyuk bury dead under their bed platforms? Even if not, it would be interesting to compare and contrast uh, the houses. Uh, okay, <laughs> few, thi few things um, straight first, I guess. Uh, yes, a few things straight here. No, they didn't bury uh, people in... Oh, under Thekla's beds here, in Thekla's here. Yeah. Hello, Thekla. Mm -hmm. um, th now, there's a bit of a misinterpretation, I think, here, because they did bury the... In Catalhoyuk, they did bury their dead underneath what appeared to be similar to bed platforms that doesn't mean to say that they were burying them underneath their own beds um when i say their own bed i mean the living people burying people underneath their own beds mm. um something that did happen um uh, in fact still does happen in in some uh, uh cultures around the world that people are buried in their own houses um, mm. And there's particularly tribes in South America, for example, where when somebody dies, are buried under the floor in their uh, in their hut. They lived there. Why would you move them? You know, why would you relocate them in the afterlife? They should stay in their home. Um, and we know that that happened in in various places in prehistory as well. It wasn't uncommon at all for houses when the uh when the person who lived in the house died that the house would be collapsed and burnt over the top of them so it would be like their own their house would be their funerary pyre if you like now cattle hoyuk they did um uh, bury the dead under platforms but there is a there's still a lot of conjecture and it's thought that there might have been a lot of excarnation going on, vultures picking the bones mm. clean, and then uh, and then the bones being uh, reinterred. Uh, very, very different from Scarra Bray. Uh, uh, people weren't buried in the houses in Scarra Bray, um, and you know you say compare and contrast their houses. Interesting differences because places like Kalahuyuk. Uh, you actually entered the houses through the roof. Yeah. Um, and in Scarabray, you had a doorway. It was a subterranean village, and you uh, you entered the houses through regular doorways, but they were in passageways yeah. that you would, um, you know, uh, yeah. Well, not so through. much subterranean, um, but inside the midian, you know, the 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 midden material was sort of insulating yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, <laughs> the point. Sorry, Rupert, you're going to say something else. No, no, that's all right. Go on. Oh, um, yeah, and of course, you know, we can't forget the um, uh, what is it, four thousand year. <laughs> Uh, difference between the two, and uh, to say nothing, yeah, uh, at least of the of the distance. So I don't think there are any correlations uh, to be made that are that are useful. Um, and also, you know, the way you build stuff is very much uh, dependent on context, what materials you've got available, and all the, those kinds of things. So, so you know, mm. the say, even if you took people from Kalahuk if you plonked them on Orkney, I doubt very much they'd end up with building the same kinds of. Uh, 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 houses that use the materials that were available to them, uh, and the fantastic thing on Orkney is that this wonderful stone mm. um, that uh, is so ubiquitous and, and fairly mm. easy to prize from the uh, landscape mm. and, and utilize. Uh, that's not to mm. you know it, it's, underplay uh, the it's skills involved. But there we go. No, indeed. Another interesting feature, though, features the right word that. You know, why would you uh, incorporate any particular uh, practicality? So, for example, in Catalhuyuk, why would you have accessed your house through the roof? And that certainly wasn't unique to Catalhuyuk, but as an no. example. And Gebekli uh, Tepe, it's, the, 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 the work at it's, Gebekli it's Tepe, the roof, in, in I, th I think um, Lee said uh, that there is a, a, um, uh, an underfloor burial in one of the uh, dwellings at Gebekli Tepe. 
which mm -hmm. is one of the finds that have led them more to believe that it was a settlement rather than um, mm -hmm. some kind of special site that uh, people came to. Um, but um, but the thing about uh, entering a house through the roof, you know, you have to if you're going to ask, you know, why would you do that? And there there could be all number of reasons from uh, whether it's uh, aggression from outside or it could be that you're just avoiding animals. You know, back in uh, in those days, you know, the wildlife that could have been coming into your settlement could have been pretty dangerous. Uh, so it's possible that uh, it just stopped any uh, kind of nuisance from coming to the front door if they couldn't climb up and get in the roof. That's, that's no, but have to go and experience it really to, you know, what the way of <laughs> life is, what the actual way of life was. You know, so that, yeah. that uh, you know, the, so live at a time when that's the normal thing, that's the norm. It's getting into that mindset where that kind of thing mm. would be the norm. I have to say, uh, big hello to Hyper Bum Fuzzle. Uh, and uh, Chubby Moth has just made it. Hello, Chubby. Yeah, uh, and there's somebody else came. I can't <laughs> see the chat. Hyper Bum Fuzzle, that's a great handle. <laughs> no, can't argue with that. <laughs> uh, terrific. Yeah. Uh, right, I'm going to move along if that's okay with you, uh, Rupert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's. Uh, do, 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 do. Ah, Standing Stone, Steve. Steve. Hello, Steve. Uh, very, uh, yeah, we know you're here, so we won't um, uh, mess about. Let's get on w with your question. Hi, guys. Is that, to your knowledge, any information regarding the settlement next to ah interesting N the settlement next to Silbury Hill? I cannot find any information online. My partner and I counted ten, fifteen footish diameter roundhouse crop marks. There were probably more. Any info gra gratefully received. Now we're not looking at the same images, or not quite sure where you're, um, you know, where this is coming from. What you're looking at to. Uh, see uh, these roundhouse uh, crop marks, uh, Steve. So can't corroborate. Um, we did have a glance, didn't we, on Google? We did. Uh, uh, Earth. And <clears throat> how adjacent... Have you, you're there, aren't you, Steve? Yeah, j just say, how adjacent to Silbury Hill are you talking about? Which, uh, and which direction from uh, Silbury Hill? Just... Uh, Mm. Bung us um, something in the chat there, <coughs> Steve. So that there are a few. We know that we're talking are, about the same thing. Yeah, there are a few features uh, that are that we know about that are not too far away, but they're certainly not adjacent. And anything, you know, if you're talking about fifteen so foot on. diameter, yeah. that's what, what, yes. What, what, uh, no, what, what, uh, Steve says, "I've been there several times. They were only visible last year. But I mean, but you can only see these in a in a aerial image, surely. Um, you wouldn't be able to see them from on the ground. You can't see crop marks on the ground. Uh, so we're, we're still a bit in the dark. Well, well, let's let's put it another way, shall we? Yeah. That uh, if you're talking about because you're asking us." specifically <laughs> so yeah so if you're asking us about 15 foot diameter crop marks then no we mm. can't tell you anything because we don't know about them if you're asking about the settlement side silbury hill um it's actually a very sprawling uh settlement that's uh that's romano british much later than silbury hill itself that we know about uh, unless you picked up something else, Michael, have you picked up something else? Uh, no, I'm just trying to position myself where um, Steve has put himself with Silbury Hill on your oh, left, West Silbury Kent Hill behind, your left. It, West it, in behind, a field yeah. to the right. Well, you, you, well, that seems like you're looking at the West Kennet uh, palisaded enclosure area down there, um, which, um, it, which we actually we've. Gathered quite a lot of information about that recently. Okay, if you're, I've got yes, that if you're looking, down in my head then. Cause... Well, if you've got if you've got West Kennet Long Barrow behind you, and you've got uh, Silbury Hill over to the uh, left, 
then West Kennet yeah. Palisaded Enclosure is, uh, as Steve says, is over to your right, just down in the in the valley by the by the Kennet River. I still don't know of any fifteen foot diameter. Well, neither uh, do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not saying you're wrong, Steve. We're saying we don't know. <laughs> yeah. But that's it. That's in that general area. Um, and uh, I mean, if you go further up on the hill, if you're looking further, much further over, there are there are a few, quite a few barrows. Uh, and <laughs> the other thing you've got to be aware of is looking down on the uh, satellite imagery. It is making sure that you're not looking at the tractor marks as they avoid the the <laughs> uh, telegraph pylons in the fields. <laughs> I do that too. Yes, I know. I'm not for a moment. Uh, Suggesting that you've made that mistake, Steve, on <laughs> on, on the ground there. Um, but if you, but there are quite a few uh, uh, like that. Um, but the, you know the other I mean, prominent they're, they're, circular things that pop out are the uh, barrows just to the north yeah. of uh, the sanctuary. Um, and in fact, if you go to and obviously it, it's it's quite a few miles away. But if you if you went to the uh, the Cairn Cemetery to the west of Stonehenge then you know you can see loads of them in the field there in particular um but i, I yeah it's an interesting one we'll we'll have to see what we can find out about because no yeah uh, i mean if you, good, steve uh, if you got any uh, if, you t if you took any photographs or anything like that um the, the, the big bung it at us because uh, uh, the, the, there's sort of nothing each one had an opening oh so you are seriously what? talking about roundhouses then oh, oh, Flipping oh, okay all right yeah 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 okay well, no, you'll have to... Well, it, it uh, makes just, total just, sense that there is an extended it, yeah. uh, settlement around there, uh, you know, round, round about the palisaded enclosures. Um, and and the, th the thing is, what date they are. I tell you what, I did come across. Uh, this this will shock you. Um, when I was... Um, uh, I have to go back to the other screen. Uh, when I was um, looking around, is this... Uh, boom. Mm. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of settlement going on there. That is Silbury Hill in the middle. Uh, I found this image on a site, which is a comprehensive survey of all the stuff from way back from the Mesolithic and Paleolithic right through to medieval times of that area around there. And this settlement stuff, which is right by Silbury Hill, uh, is Romano-British. It looks like mm. there's almost a little city there at some point. Just mm. amazing. Not a trace to see, uh, you know, um, uh, otherwise. But uh, that's uh, that's fascinating. Didn't realise that ourselves. Um, well, if you think how many times we have stood in the car park, that well, sure. walked to the end of the car park and uh, stood looking across that landscape and seen none of the stuff that shows up in the magnetometry survey, survey certainly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that that I'm just looking at uh, uh, Google Maps here, and uh, oh, I've lost it. There's the car park. There's Sil Silbury Hill, and right there's West Kennet Long Barrow, and I presume then that you're looking down into this area round here, Steve. Yeah. And this is the area of, of, of um, uh, the uh, West Kennet Long Barrows. Anyway, which, which, we need to be talking about the same thing, really, to be useful. So um, you know, mm. maybe we should... Um, uh, now I can't get yes. back to... So the, so the answer, Steve, is no. Um, <laughs> but we'll see what we can find out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Uh, uh, best we can do. Um, okay. Uh, Benjamin. Hello, Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Um, Benjamin Lawrence. I was watching something that spoke of the Bronze Age collapse, marking a shift from female mother goddess deities to more male, even monotheistic philosophies. Is there any truth in this? Or oh, I've been watching the wrong kind of history channel. Um, uh, whether there's any truth uh, in it or not, that's up for debate. But it certainly is a a thing, um, uh, because this, if I'm right, 
uh, here we're talking about uh, uh, thoughts that a an archaeologist called Maria Gimbutas had. She wrote a piece, a, a, a book, about the Kukutene Tripilia culture in Ukraine. And the, her mm. th thing was about uh, how, actually, I'll, I've got a whole thing here. I, I, can, I can read it. Just one moment. I'll just put this on full there. Uh, what you're referring to, I think, is this. Um, Benjamin, is that according to some proponents of the Kurgan hypothesis, um, Kurgan's um, getting uh, Kurgan's are the, the burial mounds in the steppe over to the east of, uh, of uh, Ukraine uh, yeah. and, and, and beyond into the Stans. Uh, 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 the origin of the Proto Indo Europeans, and in particular the archaeologist Maria Gimitas in her book Notes on the Chronology and Expansion of the Pit Grove Culture, uh, the Kukutani Tripilia culture was destroyed by force. Arguing from the archaeological and linguistic evidence, how about that? Gimitas concluded that the people of the Kurgan culture um, uh, of the Pontic Caspian steppe, being most likely speakers of the Proto Indian European language, effectively destroyed the Kukutani uh, Tripilia culture in a series of invas invasions undertaken during their expansion to the West. Based on the, this archaeological evidence, Gimbatas saw distinct cultural differences between the patriarchal, uh, work like Kurgan culture and the more peaceful, egalitarian Kukutani Tripilia culture. Um, uh, which she argued was a significant component of the old European cultures. Uh, yes, so her argument lands well in the current sort of zeitgeist about her. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's interesting, uh, though, that uh, that uh, Sibylla uh, obviously uh, is uh, certainly you're you're uh, more well read than I am on this. Similar, but uh, she says uh, 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 Gimbutas is largely discredited on that by now, though, isn't she? Um, her theories are seen as optimistic feminism of the 70s. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't actually have a, a, a sensible opinion on this. It's um, out, outside my personal remit. Yeah. Um, but it's, st it's still out there in the ether because I, I know, you hmm. know, one of the first... The, things that came up uh, you know after the uh, the invasion is people were bringing this up as uh, an echo of what had gone before of an egalitarian mm. <laughs> more egalitarian society being swept away by invaders uh, authoritarian invaders from the east uh, it seemed to be uh, history or prehistory repeating itself in the, but uh, if you take that view, then yes, it is. But I think other people do have other opinions about, and it being a more gradual process of the absorption of uh, of this particular culture. Um, yeah, so, but but that's what you're referring to, uh, and now you've got a name, uh, Ben uh, Benjamin, to um, pursue and a uh, uh, and a. Uh, um, Mm. Uh, and a, an idea to pursue, uh, and it's the uh, Kukutani C U C E C U C U T E N I hyphen T R Y P I W -L, L I A uh, culture. Uh, have a look at, uh, at that, and you'll find more along that line. Okay. And if you don't know them, have a look at their art. Apart from oh. Else. Utterly phenomenal for the well, uh, just bonkers. Well, we could go off on one completely is look at their cities. I mean, yeah. their settlements were huge. These are the bit, I mean, talking because what we're talking about a long time ago, we're talking well before we got, uh, you know, yeah, the uh, height of Cucatanian Australia was, uh, oh, heavens, seven to nine thousand years ago, was it? Yeah, something silly, and they yeah. were building massive towns. Not all of them, but you know, the, the, their settlements were quite extraordinary. It was now not the place to uh, go into it, but if you, could, if you could dig up a proper date on that, that would be great. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you are forgiven. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so they're um, 7,000 years ago, 7,500 years ago. Wow. Um, wow. Uh, but you, you look at their their ceramics in particular. Yes. Just, they're just um, beautiful. Have those on you, my you, you would any not, day. Uh, you would not blink if you if you walked past a uh, a fancy ceramics shop today and saw them in the window, uh, then you wouldn't think they were out of place at all. No. Staggering Mo stuff. Moreover, I'd be in there saying, "Take my money." Yeah, <laughs> absolutely true. Sorry, I haven't got a picture. Um, I wasn't quite expecting that. All right, should we move uh, on? It's Kev. It's uh, Kev yes, Riley. I just want. I just wanted to comment. Uh, oh, it was uh, Steve. Uh, yeah, Steve oh. says uh, guys have posted potential village site to your Facebook message. Thank you. Thank so you, thank uh, you. thanks, Steve. We'll check that out afterwards. Yeah, terrific. All right. Uh, now it's time for uh, Kev. How are you doing up there, Hi, Kev? Kev? Good to <laughs> see you. Uh, during the Zoom call. Now, before I say any more. Um, Kev is referring to a regular live thing we do with our Patreon folk uh, um, are on Zoom. It's um, exclusively for our Patreon folk. So just an example of the sort of things we get up to over there. We have a, a good old below. online bit of chinwaggery. We do. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's a bit one way, isn't it? But it gives <laughs> folk a chance to sort of talk back at us uh, live. Anyway, mm. Stephanie. Um, uh, from Germany, pointed out that the ground <coughs> down, ground down Gruss. Oh, we have to explain about the Gruss, and it's it, there is okay. no e; it's just G U R G U G R U S. Uh, yeah. Strictly speaking, there. Uh, uh, the, the Gruss was uh, was in the news uh, recently because, and in fact, we did a, an article on it uh, that uh, some pieces of Gruss from Northumberland. And the, it's the petrology that's shown that they definitely came from Northumberland, and 77 pieces of this stuff were found uh, at the West Kennet Palisades, uh, particularly in, well, only in uh, one particular building, structure number five. And uh, and we were talking about the Gruss in terms of it's a particular kind of stone. It's a, a granite um a kind of granite and uh, do i need to say anything else it came from northumberland that's why it came up in conversation here yeah yeah so um so that yeah that's what we're trying to make sense of the gruce being there you know trying to make sense of the value of the gruce is is what i think we're kev is coming from these people had transported it from one place to another place quite deliberately that was yeah. the point yeah so um, the ground down gruss was used when making pots by the Native Americans. I know this is a technical question that perhaps you could feel to one of your interviewees with more laboratory experience, but could it possible, would it be possible to test <coughs> Neolithic pots to see if gruss was used in the manufacture here in Britain and the wider Europe? The only problem I have with this, and I really need to take advice from somebody who knows what they're talking about, is that gruss in pottery terms may be a more generic term than the strict petrological term and i think it's the strict petrological term that is used to describe the gruss that came from northumberland now that may be me talking out of my ass i don't know but that surely not <laughs> surely not has been known <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that because you sent this question in in time, <laughs> I actually I sent an email to Alison Sheridan. Uh, all hail! I didn't catch uh, it. Say that again. It, you blipped as you said, Alison Sheridan. Did, name did drop. I name blip. drop. Uh, did <laughs> I blip? Alison Sheridan. She's wonderful, and she's a friend of ours. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you something that's quite wonderful about Alison is that I can buzz her an email at any time of day, and she <laughs> she replies. She's amazing. Almost immediately. It's like she's got <laughs> nothing better to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she replied uh, that the answer is yes. Of course, it's possible, though petrological thin. Uh, it's it is possible through petrological thin sectioning of Neolithic pottery to check whether gruss was used. 
Patrick Quinn of UCL, that's University College London, uh, does ceramic petrology. And you could ask him whether he's come across its use. I haven't asked him yet. I'll get around to it. Yeah. Uh, personally, I'd very much doubt whether it was used. Uh, and it has to be said at this point that Alison is pretty much an expert on ancient oh, pottery. She yeah. has done <laughs> so much research work and published books and all sorts on it. On pottery, yeah. Um, and uh, she says, I very much doubt whether it was used. From memory, the lithic inclusions in middle and late Neolithic pottery are of other stone types, with some pots even containing flint. Mm. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, but I will take her advice and ask Patrick Quinn. And, uh, and if I find anything out, I will report back. Okay. Oh, that's all we got as far as that is uh, concerned. Um, Kevin, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I just noticed uh, uh, Amber uh, said, hi, happy to see you both uh, live. Do you know uh, of any Neolithic stones in Canada? If not, why do you think... Um, I thought, Amber, you were referring, you were pointing us towards the um, medicine wheels. Uh, we did a, a piece opening. Yes, she's, uh, Rich, oh, uh, Rich has responded to that. The, uh, the Medjivale Cairn medicine wheel is in Alberta. Yeah. Uh, uh, Inneski Umapi. Well um, done. We, yeah. Uh, we did a piece uh, <laughs> at the uh, our news compendium, which was the last uh, thing we... We put posted up to YouTube um, about a week ago. <laughs> what well just yes. <laughs> what? What have I missed? Yes. Jez, Jez said uh, ceramic petrology sounds like the name of a yes album. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, because you've said that, I'll show You're you this. Right my, my son gave my son gave me this for a present. Um, because they are one of my favourite bands of all time. But look, this is a mini oil painting. <laughs> oh my goodness! How fantastic is that? Oh mini wow! Oil painting. It's yeah. It's uh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, that's funny. Thank you, Jez. You made my night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get rid of that and. Uh, we're on to Niels, Niels Brower. Hello, Niels. Uh, you are there. I can see you in the chat. As a mineralogist, I'd love it if you could shed some light on the origins of mining. Hold on a second. Hold, yes. hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. That is the harshest abbreviation of any question I have seen in all the time we've been doing broadcasts. <laughs> there was at least two paragraphs long. <laughs> Oh, I see. <laughs> Shall I read the whole question? No, no, I don't think Kevin. Uh, I don't think, I Niels think would I've expect us to do that. I think um, I've got the. Uh, I think I've got the gist of it. Uh, yeah, I, I, you have got. You have got the nub of that. Yeah. Mining, uh, not my speciality. Have you got anything more uh, here? Except I have one interesting fact. Uh, uh, I, I, ha I have got to, to, to be um, to be fair. Sorry, I, I apologise, Niels. There is sub more substance to your question. It's, you know, it get, you get very particular. Uh, Neil says he personally has a feeling that the physical properties, such as reflective, uh, the re reflectivity of metals, native copper, native mm. gold, meteoric iron, and the later colours of minerals, e.g. the beautiful shades of green and blue for secondary copper minerals, such as malachite and azurite, played quite a significant role in their discovery, making them stand out from ordinary rocks and pebbles. In a way, the curiosity that they must have had in order to explore their use is pretty much the same reason why many collectors like myself are still fascinated by them to this day. So that puts a bit more flesh on it mm. for... Uh, have you, mm. you got anything here, Rupert, or a, a, a thought? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, it's, it's worth saying to begin with, though, that... Um, how how any if you're if you're asking because uh, Mike you were talking earlier on uh, about uh, that the uh, the oldest known mine in 
in Swaziland. Where was it? Was it Swaziland? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Have you? you haven't, have you got? Oh, you, you st- <laughs> Thank you for that. The name <laughs> of the mine is Nguenia. Nguenia mine. Nguenia. Yeah, located um, on the Bonvu Ridge, northwest of Mbapane. Mbapane. In northwestern Mbappe. border of Eswatini. Excellent. And that the date of that is. 43,000 years old. 43,000 years. Uh, that's that's a long time. See, and the uh, mine oh, oh. is it, it, it's considered to be the world's oldest, and it's the hematite uh, deposit that we used uh, to extract red ochre. That's that red ochre thing. Yeah. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, but in terms of, uh, if you're talking about metal ores um you know the it, it's an interesting thing isn't it that the tin ore uh it, you know, it's such a shame that uh, james we're gonna have to get you on at some point um but uh but tin ore I, I, i've always thought that uh that um a lot of this stuff it must have been discovered by accident where they just made a fire pit and they, they had stones in the fire and when the fire went down they looked the following morning that uh, there were puddles of yeah. um, mm-hmm. you know, just the metal that had uh, seeped it. And it would have had to have been something like copper and tin. You couldn't do it. And it but anyway, I don't know. It's not my field. But um, I can say that tin mining, uh, we know, has been going on since uh, before 3,500 BC because uh, the Bronze Age in Turkey kicked off around uh, 3500 BC and therefore they had to have been mining tin in order to be making bronze um, and it's one of the frustrations of uh, of archaeology that we've talked about before you know why are there no tin artifacts why are there no copper artifacts and it's because why would you keep them if you can melt them down and make it into bronze which is a much, you know, far superior uh, substance. That's why there's none of it left. Um, the, the, the it's, it's something. In, in fact, it's Blackburn, a piece of research that we've got uh, going for, not for metal particularly, but just for more global trade. And they've found um, tin ingots, for example. They've found them in Israel, in Greece, uh, various places in the Middle East. And they know that that tin came from Cornwall. Mm. Um, and there's been gold found in France that they know came from Cornwall. Yeah. They know where it came from in Cornwall. Um, and so how long those mines have been in operation? I, I've got a thing here that it's got uh, tin mining that we know at least uh, 3,300 uh, for brass and bronze and uh, 3,500 in over in the the Levant yeah. and uh, Anatolia, um, I, th- I don't I think, know. Can Bo, I... To be fair to Neil, so Bo, the, the 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 gist of his question is not so much how far it goes back uh, and, and mm. when and where, but how. You know what is the knowledge that needs to be developed in order to know where this stuff is in the ground? That's the extraordinary That's, thing. Yeah. Without That's why the we need James on the show, exactly that, and you know, I, I think that's the basis of the question, and it's not something. It's a great question, and it's not something that I've even begun to speculate about, um, because uh, by the time we get to tin mining and and, and and well, any of it really, people have got to know what they're looking for, so there's deep yeah. knowledge I- involved, and also. You know, have a look at copper smelting, uh, because it is such a process. Rather like beer making, it, the, there's a, there's a bit in the middle that you've got to understand. You can't just melt it out of the rocks and bingo. There's copper. There's several stages of preparation that you have to go through in, in order to extract it. In the same way that you you can't just leave some uh, wheat 
uh, hops lying lying about and they ferment accidentally. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> the, you've got to know the the process. Well, uh, James is very kindly uh, commenting. Anyway, uh, James has said in the oh. comments here, prehistoric tin extraction was probably done using water systems to sort, in inverted commas, the tin ore. Uh, like gold nuggets, it's very heavy. Sadly, leaves no direct evidence of mining or even extraction. Uh, native copper, cold metal working, copper oxides recognised in the ores. Um, Cool. Okay, just scrolling down to see if there's anything else. Uh, it, it, it's an enthralling subject, and some people think that the uh, the whole Arthurian legend, uh, you know, extracting the sword from the stone, uh, came from uh, 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 from you know extracting metals from ores. It's uh, I love that idea. It's quite possible. Um, yeah. Why can't uh, I see James' posts? It's probably because if you're looking if you're looking for James's name, then uh, he he's on as Ancient Craft UK. Not even so. Oh yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Hi, James. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah. I have to say, folks, um, if you if you haven't already, uh, if you're not familiar, go and have a look at James's website. And see what he does because his work is utterly phenomenal. Really is. Oh yeah, um, on so many levels. Uh, indeed. Uh, um, um, have, so have we're, we we're... done any way at all to answer Neil's question? No, I don't think so because we don't know. We're, we're not the. We're, it's a question that we ask as well. I would have asked that question as well. Uh, you know, maybe not in the same way, but I think I uh, I know what the gist of it is. It's just. Uh, that initial thing, who carried the mm. knowledge and, and where did, it, did mm. it initiate from? But it is interesting that we've got a date of the earliest mine of 43,000 years BC in, uh, in Swaziland. Uh, I think that's the best we can do for the moment, though, isn't it, Rupert? We did our best, Niels. Yeah, um, it's, we'll keep our eyes open, you know, for something... Um, you know, along those lines. <laughs> and James, if you've got any more, anything more to say, then uh, um, ancient uh, um, uh, Kevin asking, what's James' uh, uh, website URL? Just put in Ancient Craft UK, uh, and it will yeah. come up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so it's on to uh, Dale's question. Hello, Dale. Um, Okay, guys. Actually, there were two okays in there. Okay, okay, guys, he said. <laughs> uh, the earliest agriculture is always spoken of as farming. Well, should we possibly rena rename it all to prehistoric ranching? Oh, you've opened a can <laughs> of worms here, uh, Dale. Uh, <laughs> it goes on to say, uh, the value of meat as a food source through the winter and the storage of grain with a primary purpose as a winter livestock feed seems pretty straightforward. How about it? Livest livestock first, then wild. Then when wild grains mutated to forms more easily harvested, well, great, more goats, chickens, geese, pigs, sheep or cattle in which to store the calories for more hungry times. Mm. The man's been thinking this through. Mm. I, um... I don't know how you'd query the evidence to establish whether that was a possible order of things, except that, if, forgive me, if Wikipedia has, uh, is, is anything to, to go by. One thing I was fascinated by, although um, the, uh, the, the, your wheats and your emmas and your barleys and your grains and, and things... It all seems when it appears first, it, it appears around about 10,500 years BC in several places. Earlier than that, the, the domestic of, domestication of sheep happens 13,000 years ago. Mm. Uh, now, obviously, there must be gaps in the record and all that kind of thing, but the, 
the first domestication of anything, grains or animals, seems to be the domestication of sheep in Mesopotamia 15,000 mm. years ago. It's it's uh, it's an interesting thing with ovicoprids generally. So sheep and goats as a collective thing, um, much easier to feed in uh, uh, in more drought uh, prone places. Uh, so th they can extract sufficient nutrition from poor quality grass and sparse, um, you know ground scrub that sort of thing uh, it, in ways that cows just could never do um uh, sheep and goats are just wonderful for that which is why you always find them in places like the uplands of spain or uh you know or throughout uh, uh anatolia uh, mm -hmm. for example now we did a piece of oh, good heavens above it was 18 months years ago uh, we did a piece about uh, the early domestication there. And as you say, we're talking about a ridiculous amount of time ago. Um, but then there was the Natufians as well. And the Natufians, um, that was the oldest known bread. No, it was the oldest known toast, actually. So they had to have made, had to have made bread to have made the toast in the first place. And that was 14,000 years ago. Um Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to gather it all together in my head because, well, so, so the thing I. is, we... but I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by, um, by, by uh, Dale's hypothesis, which I, I think is a is a great symbiosis of, of, of things. It makes sort of sense, and I'm just, like I said before, I'm just wondering how you'd query the data to to establish, you know, if, if there's something in that. I bet you that you know mm. if that symbiosis is correct, uh, you know between the the between the the grains and and cattle etc., that this is where mm. beer making comes in. I bet there's <laughs> be, because uh, you see the Maybe. yeah, but because the fermented grain is good cattle feed because it's full of calories. Stuff anyway. I, I may be making that up, but I was, my memories of our conversations with uh, Merrin Dinley about the making of beer there was there was that conversation came up where it, the beer may have come from that cycle of of feeding cattle. Interesting. I don't think I'm making that up. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Sorry, oh, I'm, you're not I'm laughing at me. By I, comments, I can never tell. I was laughing at you actually, but I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, uh, I, I'm laughing at some of these comments as well. Uh, Helen says my maiden name means red deer. Apparently, Middle Eastern origins bringing red, uh, bringing red along to Northern Europe. Well, that is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's funny. I'm picking up on another comment. Uh, Sibir said earlier on. She said uh, that. Uh, about uh, chicken domestication, uh, and that's another thing we did a a, a, a piece uh, of our, in our news compendium recently that there was uh, a new piece of research that they've actually found that the domestication of the goose predated the domestication of the chicken uh, by some way. They've got evidence in China for the domestication of the goose. Uh, Seven thousand uh, years ago, which is uh, quite impressive, but uh, nothing mm. like as long ago as sheep and goats uh, as all, which is interesting because yeah. somebody else pointed out that domesticating a goose, you've got a good guard dog then as well, haven't you? <laughs> well, yep. you never know. I mean, that, you know, it's you actually not really a silly. Don't. It's not a silly thought. But uh, yeah. no, uh, like you're thinking, Dale, and. Um... Uh, sorry, we can't be you know, obvious, uh, more definitive it's, than that. It's, it's a, a nice idea. Point. It's a nice yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, terrific. Okay, that said, I will uh, now attempt to move along. If I can move all the windows on my screen all over the place. <laughs> In the, hmm, it's a good job I knew what I'm doing. Thank you. Well, that's interesting, yeah. There we go. And it's Jimmy. Hi there, Hello, Jimmy. Jimmy. Uh, are you there? I think I've seen uh, 
Jimmy around. Uh, anyway, Jimmy asks, uh, oh, did we think stone circles were painted? Do we see them as we see medieval cathedrals, which were ablaze with colour when built? Maybe these multi-purpose spaces were using pigment to denote today's use of stones. Uh, any evidence or pigment, or is it just too long ago? I'm afraid the answer is going to be short on this one, Jimmy. There is absolutely no evidence at all of um, no, paint being not used. Not a scrap. Too, for, for, yeah. um, not a scrap. The, only, the only paint that we can tell you about with any certainty is at the Rollwright Stones, where <laughs> on a number of occasions vandals slapped paint all over it. Um, yeah. Beyond that, there is n n no evidence of. When we any were filming paint. Standing yeah. with Stones, <laughs> the Druid Circle up at Ulverston, just down on the south coast of the lake, just, you know, uh, overlooking Morecambe Bay, that had recently had red paint splashed on it. Yeah. I don't the, the, understand why people want to go out into the countryside into the middle of the night and splash paint on an ancient site. Why would you do that? Yeah. So I we we don't have ev any evidence for paint. There's no reason to say you know, that, that what uh, what uh, Martin says. Uh, hello, Martin uh, says. Uh, so uh, for other folks who might not know, before <gasps> Caledonia. Oh. Uh, uh, Martin says there was colour found at Isakola's recumbent stone circle in Aberdeenshire. I did not know that, know Martin. That. Can you tell us any more? Can you tell us were, what colour? Um, well, mm -hmm. most crucially, were they able to date it? And if so, how? Hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, that was, so there you go. So I was talking out of my backside. There is absolutely, so, absolutely no evidence of, of paint in the near -lip. Well, I didn't know and of any. And that's it. You didn't take it oh. there yourself, Martin, did you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, interesting, interesting. I mean, because uh, obviously, uh, if you, if you step outside of the UK, he said optimistically, um, <laughs> filling in time, that Martin was going to put an answer down. Um, yeah. but, uh, if you step outside of the UK, then. Uh, in uh, South America, for example, particularly, or um, uh, Mexico, even. Yeah. That, uh, so, okay, we're talking about sites that are significantly later, but nevertheless, uh, you know, they have mm. found uh, a lot of traces of color there, and there is some evidence. Well, in fact, there's quite a lot of evidence for color being used in, uh, in Egypt, mm. for example. But. Mm. Um, in the UK, I think one of the in, uh, inherent problems is that we 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 don't know if the stone circles, you know, how how we see and perceive these stone circles. We have no idea, if, you know, what the, the actual structure looked like when they were in use. When um, what are you here? Uh, if they did, they better they'd have more wangs on than a modern bus stop. <laughs> You speak Move, wise words, Obi Wan. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, well, while we're on the topic, I didn't expect this to flourish in the way it quite has, uh, uh, Jimmy. <laughs> while we're on the subject, uh, is there any evidence in um, burials in the Neolithic of the use of red ochre? I can't recall, and it, it, it being a thing that's ever been m made any uh, song and dance about, certainly on the continent. But I can't remember any evidence of uh, ochre use specifically. Uh, in Britain, are we uh, talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's my point. Britain, uh, uh, no, well, you've got the uh, Red Lady of Pavola, haven't you? Uh, oh, in, in Wales. Um, yeah. So but it's, that's that's massively old, though. Um, what's the date of uh, him, <laughs> the Red Lady? It's a uh, it's twelve, what eleven, twelve, eleven BC, isn't he? Something crazy, not long after. It's, the it's humongously old. I mean, when it, <clears throat> yeah. it, it doesn't it, it doesn't um, it doesn't connect with any of the burials that we would be talking about in the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And then Nigel says, you know, paint of some sort must have existed for body adornment or internal building uh, decoration. So why not stones? Yeah. Uh, Red Lady is Paleolithic. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. 
Red was found in the burial sites in uh, North America. Absolutely. Um, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's chase that down, you know, Rupert, I mean, it, and find that out if red ochre was a thing, uh, you know, in uh, our in the Neolithic at, at least. And I, I can't think of any particular record, uh, well pointed out about the red lady, of course. He, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, Jennifer, red ochre was mined on Wharton Crag, Lancashire coast. Do we know when it was? Um, uh, well done. Uh, Karen yeah, says, uh, uh, I'm, I'm holding office hours, so missed some. Did you mention the colour found at the Ness of Brodger? Um, oh, of course we... No, we didn't. Bingo. No, we didn't. Bingo. There you go. Um, uh, thank you. I knew there was something lurking at the back of my mind. Um. But do we think, to get back to the question, Jimmy, do we think stone circles were painted? I don't know. One um, can only assume that uh, some people had the use of, of paint. Uh, I mean, the uh, Nessa Brogka is an instance, but it's not by any means ubiquitous. Um, mm. Yeah. So, because of course, one, one of the other problems that we really do have all right, <clears throat> is that you could have a, a site that was built, uh, let's say, for the sake of argument, 6,000 years ago, and 5,000 years ago, a bunch of vandals who've been drinking Neolithic beer um, uh, uh, just go and slap graffiti all over this uh, stone circle. And then 5,000 years later, we're going, oh, look, 5,000-year-old paint. And it's not that somebody actually painted the stone circle. Well, they did, but uh, but you know, not, not for the same reasons. And I say that only half glibly because I'm just making a point that how yeah. we know. How, how the heck um, would you date it? I'm, yeah. I'm reminded of the time that Lee Bray, who was the chief archaeologist on, on Dartmoor, uh, made the point when he was referring to the display boards that are sometimes alongside ancient sites placed there by uh, venerable institutions like English Heritage and the National Trust, you know, artists' representations. And he was saying, they always tend to be a bit dour and grey. <laughs> Yeah, and lacking in <laughs> colour. He's thinking, where, well, where is the paint? Where's the he where are the headdresses? Where are the feathered um, ornaments uh, and those kinds of things? It, it, it is trouble. Without the evidence, we tend to paint things a bit grey back then. But I bet you, I bet you, um, it'd be a, without specifically saying they painted their stone circles. Uh, I would say uh, goings on were a darn sight colourful, more colourful than we give them credit. And I think that's the best we can say, don't you, Rupert? I do. I do. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, th thanks for the question, uh, Jimmy. We, we've got a comment here from uh, Jeff, Jeff Duke in the Boyne Valley. Hello, Jeff, who says, Jeff came Duke? here for the Nelth, came the, here for the not... Nelth Maestead. Stayed for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> that's nice that's one. That's very kind of you. <laughs> uh, Je Jeff Duke, um, any relationship to the Manx um, TT racer of the 1950s? Sorry, he was when I was little, when I was four years old, apparently he was, uh, Jeff Duke was my hero. I lived on the Isle of Man. I was, I was born on the Isle of Man. Anyway, uh, motorcycle racer, yeah. Uh, sorry, digress. Um, mm. Let me uh, move along here. Oh, Lord. Get rid of that. Um, How did you get in twice, Jimmy? Uh, oh, no, it's Lazzy. Sorry, Lazzy McLandrover. Matt. Oh, hello, Matt. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen you in, in the chat. Uh, hope you're around. Um, oh, for digging henges, there is evidence of antlers being used for picks and cattle shoulder blades being used for shovels. But it got me thinking. Dressed and decorated stone, e.g. Gavrinus, Newgrange, and axe motifs at Stonehenge, etc. What would have been in the toolkit for a Neolithic stone carver when there is, are no metal tools? Yeah. Over to you, James. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, uh, um, um, I wish. <laughs> Do you know what? what? It, it, it's this is a genuinely fascinating subject because uh, obviously. Listen, it, I'm going to put about... James. If if you're up for it, mate, I'm just putting the link uh, to join us in eCam in our app here. If you're up for that, please do pop along. It doesn't matter if you're not, um, but uh, not going to. Don't want to put you on, on the James spot. Just says in any way. Check my, oh, okay. All right, I, I don't know if uh, if what Michael's trying is working, but I will read this. James has very kindly sent me an email. I'm just going to read it to you. Um, answers to questions. Um, and now I sent James two questions, and oh right, okay. Uh, so this is question two. Okay, I'll do that one first. Um, <clears throat> James said, it's a relatively simple answer, and we have to look at quartz-rich pebbles or lithic materials. Yep. Sites that were not cleared of work waste are often surrounded by smashed quartz pebbles. The rock art sites in Scotland and northern yep. England have yielded huge quantities of such waste. A simple cup mark in reasonably hard stone can take around 90 minutes, according to experiments by Hugo Anderson Weimark. Uh, it's interesting, these rock art sites are left messy. Uh, were they ever intended to be reused as ceremonial spaces, like the tidy forecourts of Newgrange, Stonehenge, etc.? That's a good question. That is a good yeah. question. <clears throat> uh, so 90 minutes for a, for a cut mark. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, we also uh, sourced a, a paper by uh, an archaeologist in France who had That's more got... relevant to the question that you haven't brought up yet. Uh, no. <laughs> Isn't it? No. It's... <laughs> go, 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 go on then. You carry on. Um... No, I, th I thought this was particularly to do with uh, the because it mentioned because uh, Lazzie Matt mentions Gavrinis uh, specifically. Well, am I looking at uh, am I looking at my questions the wrong way around? Uh, no, you you uh, you gave a good answer because you just said about the quartz. Quart and uh, he, he, James is hold on a second. I'm going to add him onto you gave the right. a good answer because you just said about the quartz. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yay! Hello. Uh, I'll bring you in again, there, James. Sorry. There you are. There's. Hello, James. Uh, We've got the sound from your computer, James. And there, be off there, now. We're, he's we're done. At, he's sorted well that out. Yeah. Or, or yeah. We're out of sync. So uh, it's good to uh, see you. It really yeah, good to it's, see it's you. Been yeah. a while, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh, We've given you a fair introduction already, and I think uh, you know it's, it's great to uh, have you on to uh, talk about this uh, aspect. I was just about to say, I'd seen there was a paper by a French uh, archaeologist who they tried to reproduce the techniques used in Gavrinis, and had come up mm -hmm. with all sorts of uh, measurements about how long it t took them to do that. And surprise, surprise, the uh, the quartz pebbles thing. Uh, uh, came up as the only way of uh, uh, of doing it with reasonable efficiency. Um, have you? Have yeah, you? And have you? If you, um, you must have had a go with uh, using. Quartz yeah, definitely. Pebbles. Um yeah. And uh, it, it's interesting to try different qualities of quartz as well. Um, mm. And it it really varies for what you're trying to achieve. Because if, if you're just after a, a fairly simple cup mark, um, you know, you can just have a quartz rich pebble, quartzite, even quite a hard sandstone. And, and because it's a, a siliceous material, you can almost nap it to a finer point. Mm. Um, so you, as well as relying on the hardness of the tool, you can actually manipulate it for certain tasks. But if you're after really fine carving, whether it be for rock art or portable art, um, like your mace heads and your carved stone balls, because you can actually flake it as well, you've got that hardness uh, that gives you that edge. And, and the key bit and the, the, the answer that, that I gave um, was for quartz 
it is one of the hardest minerals that we have in any kind of abundance. It's yeah. even harder than flint. Um, and for as far as I know, um, a, even any of the decorated flint work that's been carved is generally a softer flint. So you're just making your life a little bit easier. Because if you were trying to carve some of that jet black Norfolk flint, you'd probably be there till the Bronze Age, just because it's so much harder. <laughs> Um, yeah. And it's quite amazing. We think of, of flint being sort of a really hard material, but even within that, there's quite a range of hardnesses. And when I'm napping it, it's so noticeable what you can and can't get away with. Um, but for something like the Nouth Mace Head that has that sort of creamy, browny, white texture to it, there have been suggestions yeah. that um, it's to uh, mimic uh, like a scudamorph um, of some of the antler mace heads um, that you get from. Uh, the Neolithic as well. There's the fantastic oh, one yeah. in uh, Bury St. Edmunds. Yes, yes. Um, which has very similar spiral designs. I have to find the reference for exactly um, where it was found looking up at the bookcase above me. Um, but yeah. um, it, it's quite interesting that particular flint was selected because it's not very common, but uh, mm. it is also soft. It is a beautiful and exquisite little thing, though. And it is little. I mean, it's, it's about, you know. Yeah about that size and it's in the uh, uh, current uh, Stonehenge uh, 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 exhibition at the British Museum uh, sort of not so long ago. Yes, when we were up in uh, Achnebrek and uh, we met uh, Aaron Watson, Watkins, is it? Mm -hmm. Watson. Watson. Um, Watson. Yes. Uh, he was, and it was a surprise to us then. We didn't, uh, we didn't know, you know, that the the, um, the quartz scatter around there told a tale of uh, of all that rock art being created with the application uh, of quartz, and led us to speculate as to the effect when you hit uh, stuff with uh, hard stuff with quartz. Do you get a bit of? Um, fluorescence going off uh, or... uh, sort of and it, it was something that we explored with uh, Gavin McGregor and uh, uh, Kenny um, from uh, Glasgow when we, uh, we did the burning circle events on Aaron um, and Kenny for Brophy. part of the evening we... Ken... sorry Kenny Brophy Kenny Brophy, Kenny Brophy yes uh, indeed. Yeah. Um, we as part of it, tried to do a sort of audience participation component to the evening before the main burn-in of trying to show some quartz pebble uh, illumination. Um, but uh, and there was me sat there with with, with my kit on um, in front of one of the timbers, and uh, no no one had their light on, and it looked great because every so often I'd move and rub the pebbles and it'd be like oh look there's a tiny bit of light over there and then some <laughs> very very clever person and if you're in the live chat i still don't forgive you but some very very clever person decided it'd be a good idea to shine a very bright torch on me so that they could see what i was doing so all of the light <laughs> was gone <laughs> yeah there's always one yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it was funny. I have to say, uh, Kev uh, uh, Kev Riley has uh, has asked you to uh, um, uh, give uh, the so definition of silicious. Silicious, uh, high high in silica. So flint is silicious, quartz, um, porcelain. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, I like using it and then immediately saying, which sounds dangerously close to delicious. Like salacious. Oh, okay. I category. thought salacious. Uh, so no, uh, that says more about me than it does about you. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, I, you can't help but think, you know, that, that uh, there's a kind of magical, if, you know, the, the luminescence thing, there's a kind of magical quality to the creation of, uh, of rock art in that instance. Um, the other thing that uh, I've forgotten the name of the archaeologist, it was did the uh, bit of um, um, <clears throat> experimental archaeology with the Gavrinis or trying to copy the Gavrinis um, etchings, and that is. Uh, that one of the remarkable things, certainly if trying to chip stuff out in an enclosed space, that it's loud. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she, she, she said, worse than the the wear and you know uh, and, and the shoulder ache and uh, the the hard work, was actually the volume of the the sound repeatedly. 
you know, over hours and hours yeah, yeah. Uh, on on your ears, which was uh, mm. an interesting. Uh, sort yeah, of... and I, I have to sign off uh, part of my risk assessment for something called Napper's Knock. Oh. Genuinely, my, oh my that lord, repetitive. Yeah, it is. It is an actual thing um, that the oh, Brad and Gunflinters would have suffered with in their yeah. small enclosed space, yeah. as well as the dust. Um, yeah. That c consistent ringing, knocking noise m must have been pretty bad uh, mm. over mm. a period of time. Wow. Okay, that's interesting. But certainly yeah. in that Kilmartin type landscape, it, it's a different noise to napping. It, it's a much um, uh, not quite a booming noise, but it, it's got more. Um, so someone with more of a musical vocabulary than me will, would be able to define it, but uh, sort of knocking against a, a much larger, harder surface rather than just a little block of flint. Um, yeah. So it would have been quite distinct. Well, it's much bigger resonance, isn't it? Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then those stones are, are quite um, encapsulated in, in the landscape and the grass around them, so it's not like having a, a great big piece of granite on the top of Dartmoor that you tap that and it actually rings mm -hmm. because it's yeah. connected to the ground. And again, that's why I wonder about these spaces that their role in the landscape uh, comes into question when when these spaces aren't tidied and they don't show it, any other evidence of activity other than people sort of going up there purely to do rock art. Was that the only reason they existed? Was just you know, gangs of young people going up there to make a bit of a mess and a bit of a noise and the parents would sort of let them go on their way? I mean, it, it, it's a, a little bit uh, fanciful to sort of put it in that way, but... Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there's some grounds in having that separation between the likes of New Grange or, or the yeah. others that do have clearly very reused and tidied space. And we look at Stonehenge; it's it's actually archaeologically quite sterile because yeah. it's it's one of these places that's continually tidied. Um, mm. So they seem to be quite different spaces. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, talking of Stonehenge, of course, and not must be can't be overlooked the amount of work that went into dressing the faces of the Sarsen stones. It's something that that uh, Mike Pitts uh, goes into in his book, and uh, <laughs> the only see, seems the only way of doing that was hitting the Sarsen stones with other sar with Sarsen stone balls. Uh, a massive enterprise to get some of the the the, the uh, uh, the, the trilith and stones into the shapes they are. Anyway, I think Matt, uh, thank you for the question. I think you've got probably got more than you bargained for there. <laughs> you certainly got happy. more than your money's worth. Although I wanted to say, and it might be relevant to another question that I'm sure you've still not well, put up. Um, well, I have. Well, I, I know what? it's Oliver's. It's it's the next uh, question co coming up, uh, uh, Rupert. Um, Jolly just... good. Well, in that case, I'll save my. Uh, don't go away, James, because. Uh, the... <laughs> Your input on this one will be just as uh, just as good. Uh, if, uh, I just want to pick up on a couple of comments uh, here. Oh, actually, Sibylla says, I'd love to hear more from James about how to work with antler and what it's like as a substance. Uh, Sibylla, have, you, you must have a look at James's website. Um, yeah. And, and also, uh, you've got a YouTube channel as well, haven't you, James? I have. Yes, um, just Surely, look yeah. for Ancient Craft UK. Um, yeah, to, just Ancient look, Craft UK. Um, look at my handle that I've commented James... on it is that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and uh, some James excellent got some, films uh, there great as well. Films if I say so. as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, because this segues into Oliver's question also. Uh, you know, who mm -hmm. specifically asked about the uh, um, the Nauf, uh Mace Head. Um, but, so we've pretty much answered uh, Oliver's question. Uh, um, so I recently went to the Stonehenge exhibition at the British Museum. One of the stand artifacts on display was a carved flint mace head. So, so not just the uh, Nauf uh, mace head. Totally blew my socks off. To me, it's almost easier building Stonehenge than carving flint perfectly without metal tools. Has anyone tried to replicate the processes? As I would love to know. And here you are. As far Here's as the man who has. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, the thing is, I'd love to be able to say yes. I've gone through the whole process myself, 
Um, and sadly, in, in this day and age, it, it comes down to if I can get some museum or institution to pay for me to do it, then I can. But uh, being yeah. able to justify the hundreds of hours hundreds to of... Uh, make one purely for fun, because there wouldn't be any fun. It would be really miserable to do. <laughs> uh, it, uh, sadly, this day and age came very close um, because uh, I was involved with... Um, some colleagues making the uh, Neolithic life footage, which is now on display at Newgrange and now FISTA Centre. Um, and we talked quite early on about showing the replication of the Nowth Macehead. And they said, well, how much you know, do you think it would cost to make one? And I, I just sort of, I know, almost dart on a dartboard and just say what thousands probably just for the hours and they just yeah. immediately look back down that nope we haven't got the budget for that well, yeah fair enough that's why there's only yeah. one yeah but um, yeah yeah no, i can certainly say from carved stone ball experience which i've got plenty more experience of um it's a very 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 long time and uh, it's miserable work it really is um, mm. it's very taxing I... um, both from the knock and the constant impact it's it's really really miserable Wow. I've wanted to ask you for a long time and kept forgetting. Um, how on earth do you think they made the Towie ball? Uh, for those of um, you that don't know, yeah. the Towie ball is the most intricate of the Scottish carved stone balls. It's the most stunning thing. But it's so the 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 lines, the just the fineness of the lines and the designs, is extraordinary. I just, how would you do that? Well, that, that's slightly easier to approach than the Nowth Mace Head because it's a softer material. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. something like flint or quartz would be easier. And the interesting thing about carved stone balls is that they appear in areas, mostly in Aberdeenshire, where there's flint. Um, Aberdeenshire mm -hmm. is one of the most northerly sources of direct from the ground flint at the Den of Bodham. Uh, and I'm sure that's not a total coincidence that you get a density of carved stone balls nearby the den of bottom because something like flint for making just very simple, almost debitage, I mean, I say debitage somewhat flippantly, um, but at least having small shards of flint will give you that quite figurative edge to actually work the stuff on, on a very fine level. Um, and there is a video on the English Heritage uh, for, uh, YouTube, rather, and I think it, we've put it on my own YouTube uh, under the, uh, there we go, there's a picture, um, on the, the features section where I make a replica, not of the Towie carved stone ball, um, but of the old deer carved stone ball, also from Aberdeen. Uh, it's on display in the British Museum and is currently alongside the Towie ball as part of the World of Stonehenge exhibition. Um, and... Mm -hmm. For this yeah, filming, yeah. I was asked to make a finished one in several stages um, because they wanted to film it in an afternoon. And, I, you know, you have to watch the, the video and appreciate that the video is not showing the whole thing start to finish because they would have to be there filming for days and days and days. It's just not reasonable. Um, but it shows the processes along the way. And you see quite quickly that it is just hitting another rock not even with the precision of flint nap and it is just quite literally hitting another rock and very slowly whacking it into shape uh, and the final design work even for the um, old deer carved stone ball it's actually really crude if you look at the original um, would recommend if you're at the stonehenge exhibition have a really really good look at the decoration because it's quite easy to get overwhelmed but if you start to look really carefully at many of them some of the decoration is crap um, they, particularly the old deer carved stone ball. Um, Other technical terms are available. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's my, my no nonsense approach to uh, three decades. Uh, well, that's, that. that's a bit lazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, some of the lines um, just they're not straight, they don't line up. Um, and, and I'm not sort of suggesting that there's a reason for that. It, it's just where they've gone round, run out of space and just sort of squeezed in alongside another and have mm. made some mistakes along the way because they ran out of space. Um, and they've gone to all that effort of making bosses that aren't even straight. Um, and they have ended up with this quite wonky looking carved stone ball. And it's like, wow, it's a carved stone ball. It's like, yeah, but it's <laughs> not exactly artistic. Uh, 
prowess, but there we go. <laughs> We're looking forward to going back to the British Museum in June, uh, uh, Rupert and I. We've been uh, we invited to we a are. private uh, viewing, uh, so would you know? Yeah. Nice. I have to say, there is absolutely no substitute for seeing these things up in in the flesh. And if you can get to the British Museum before the uh, exhibition ends in July, I can uh, highly recommend it. There's quite nothing quite like to being close up to these very, very special uh, artefacts, Towie Ball, that maze head, and, and several other maze heads. And just uh, these things will not be together in the same place at the same time uh, uh, again in our life, lifetimes. Uh, it is just to get eyeballs on uh, this stuff is uh, such a privilege. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you so much, uh, James. Uh, do stick around if you're, uh, if you're not stuck for time, because we're... No, we're... no, honestly, I was, um, was watching alongside, I thought, oh, I'll answer Rupert's email, but I'll listen to their live, and it was like, oh, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the, the two sort of combined, but I, I, if, if I may, <laughs> wanted to sort of go back to the mining question, because I yes, yes. sort of desperately type in and listen at the same time, um, and I think the key thing is with copper, is that for a lot of communities around the world, in, including North America and the East and uh, even in Europe, um, some of the earliest copper tools and objects used um, were native copper. Um, and for those that are right. not um, geologically mm -hmm. or from a metallurgist background, um, a native metal is a naturally occurring metal uh, or in a metallic state. So gold, gold nuggets that we often think of, um, that's an, in a metallic state. So it's technically native gold. We just call it gold. Um, but with copper, it can occur in a natural metal state. It's softer oh, okay. um, than smelted copper slightly, um, which is not ideal for holding an edge, but you don't have to do any extra smelting or anything. You can just quite literally hammer mm. it mm. into your shape as you need it. But once you've got that copper and you're using it, if it's got a bit of dampness on it or one of your kids or uh, siblings leaves it out in the rain or something, you know, I'm sure nothing changes over thousands of years, but <laughs> you'll get that oxidization on the surface like our yes. copper pipes around and outside the house. And once you've yeah. made that connection to that green, which is quite a distinctive color in rocks and yeah. the very unusual green heavy rocks that came from the same place as the native copper, you've got your connection. That doesn't answer how the heat got involved, but it's quite likely that as people manipulated native copper, they noticed that it starts to heat up. Because if you bash metal and manipulate it, it heats up. Mm. And for mm. people who would have been very used to heat treating stone and flint to make it easier, mm. heat treating copper to make it easier to work would have been absolutely normal. It would have made sense to them. And with the application of a bit more heat and a bit more heat and a bit more heat, uh, eventually you'll end up just melting it. Um, and at that point, you are actually casting. So the jump from metal, from stone tools to the Bronze Age proper is actually a gradual leap. The pottery okay. theory is that a piece of lucky copper ore would have been in a pottery kiln is extremely unlikely because most mm -hmm. prehistoric pottery is not fired to anywhere near a thousand degrees. Uh, master potters like Graham Taylor of Potted History will tell you that. Um, mm. And it needs to be a thousand degrees to start to smelt copper. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, they've got to be really intentional to get uh, that heat going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, James read your mind there, Niels. Thank you so much for that, uh, James. I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to move on now. Uh, as I say, stick around, James, if you want, or you, mm. you, if you've got better things to do, do feel free <laughs> uh, to take yourself <laughs> away. Um, so, uh, and it's uh, a question from Pat, Pat Davis. Hello, Pat. How are you? Uh, hi, guys. Following on from your recent <coughs> moot here, I'm going to refer back to Patreon again. Our moots happen. Uh, it's the Monday moot. happens every Monday. Uh, and... Um, yeah, it's uh, Rupert and I pick a topic and we just uh, make a little podcast, especially for our Patreon fans. Link in the description mm. below. <laughs> Following on from your recent moot on the Avebury complex, how did the site at Windmill Hill fit into the use of the wider Avebury landscape, if at all? Well, uh, do you want to kick off there, <laughs> Rupert? Or? No, I just think the if at all is, uh, is sublimely put. Um, uh, okay. Because Windmill Hill 
predates uh, the the wider use of you know the wider Avebury by a, a long way. Um, well, it predates what we uh, Avebury by a long way, but it's contemporary yeah. with uh, West Kennet, uh, obviously, up on the uh, with West Kennet, the, yes, yeah, um, and with Wayland Smithy not far down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, up the road, I should say. Um, yeah, because Windmill Hill is a causewayed enclosure, which was in use for a pretty long time. But I think it's uh, if, it may have still been have been used. Uh, no, I'm not sure. I don't think it was in use at, at all when uh, Avebury and, and the other in the avenue and uh, the sanctuary. Uh, went up. If there are links to be made, it's with whatever uh, you know, the, the 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 certainly. I mean, because we're talking about three thousand eight hundred BC for as a, as a date, roughly for uh, for Windmill Hill, which is the same as uh, West Kennet, um, uh, East Kennet, obviously, uh, and any other. Uh, can't think of any other that trip off them. Oh, there's the uh, White Horse uh, Barrow. Just between the White Horse on the side of the hill there, not far from the uh, actual Uffington White Horse, not far from Wayland's Smithy again. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the thing we come often come back to, isn't it, Rupert? Although we've got a cluster of things happening all at the same time, or so it seems in the Avebury landscape. Mm. Uh, to people who lived at Windmill Hill, uh, it, it, um, yeah, they mm. wouldn't see. As much as we do. No, and uh, the, 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 there are various problems with this, and one is that you know we we just love to make connections or try to make connections where sometimes they just they might not be there to be made, um, and it you know so we're we're guessing at connections, you know. Um, and we, we don't really that there's no evidence to to give us any pointers there. Um, uh, and the other thing is that we see these periods in history, prehistory, that th these things might have been separated by stay a century. Uh, you know, now to make a connection between you know people living in this place a century before or after the people in this place and we're trying to make a connection well you know maybe maybe mm. but we, we you know we just have no way of knowing for sure um, yeah. all we can ever do is put these things up as possibilities and maybe evidence will arise at some point in the future that will give us uh, a clearer idea uh, but certainly for, for for the time being we can't really say more than that can we have you got anything wise to say yes i have <laughs> windmill You're hill just happens windmill hill <laughs> just hap windmill <laughs> hill just happens to be the biggest co known causewayed enclosure uh, in britain so there's that uh, uh, what link what a, what's your question robert sorry you just said windmill hill is the biggest causewayed enclosure in britain yes correct are you telling me yeah. causeway enclosure? Okay. Causeway enclosure, yes. Uh, uh, in, and is, so what I'm saying is, by mentioning that, is you've got big stuff all in that landscape. So what was going on then? The there was so there was something so important about the whole landscape that it was attracting a lot of people down through mm. the millennia. Uh, that's the the only mm. thing I was going to say about that, Rupert. Yeah. Do Do we know how many uh, many causeways there were, Windmill Hill? I mean, obviously we do, but do you know? I don't know. Um, I think you the, know, the, 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 how many causeways? How many rings? How many rings there are? You mean? Uh, no causeways. Um, well, that's what I mean. Same difference. Yeah. <laughs> quick, quick okay. Search there, which foot to throw in the arm straight away. But, um, I, was it three rings? Three. It's there three are. Yeah, three rings. Yeah. Is it three? Yeah. Um, okay. I think so. Um, um, but I was just thinking about the connections that you you were talking about. Um, and I've yeah. Tr 
again, it, it, the problem is when you do everything for the Paleolithic to the end of the Bronze Age, you, you've got so many references in your head. But I seem yeah. to remember <laughs> there being some reference to some axes from North Wales from oh, the yeah. Group 7 that were in the Avebury Ditch, and they would be early Neolithic and they would be in circulation around the time that Windmill Hill was active, but they were in the Avebury Ditch. But I'd have to check the reference Oh, for that. you're thrown a googly, you th- your bubbles yeah, is no, all a googly no. there. Yeah. I know. I'm not surprised I'm we don't certain. hear more about that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty certain there's some weird connection there. Um, mm. But I'd, you I'd made definitely a film have about... to check that. Yeah, I did, yeah. You and... made a very, very nice film about... Uh, uh, stuff from North Wales, from uh, uh, axe heads from North Wales. Uh, I advise you yeah. uh, to check it out. I want to go up to North Wales and the Druid cir- Circle up there and do a thing about it because there's so much going on uh, around those, you know, what seems to me a huge trading site up there yeah. over- overlooking Conway Bay and, uh, 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 yeah. Well, so you, much more than just the stone circle up there. If you um, let me know, I can take you on a tour, including to a few spots where there is just a slope of scree and broken axes it's not very well known about. Ooh, Ooh. take you up on that. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's Langdale-esque, but isn't known about. Yeah. Is okay. that right? Okay. Excellent. All right. Okay, thank you. We'll forget that. We'll take, yeah. Sorry. Anyway, uh, that's the best we can do. Not bad though, um, but I think that's the best we c- we can do. We're coming uh, to racing towards the end. Um, how are we doing for time? Not too bad. Um, so, um, Pat, thanks so much for that. And um, Mark's question, Mika Mika, Mark. Uh, I'd like to ask you both a potentially daft question. Is there any evidence of sport or competition in the Neolithic? Oh, yes. my Lord, how long have you got? Yeah. Uh, this is, no, there this isn't. So but... not a daft question. We love <laughs> this question. We've all yeah. seen um, early, uh, the art uh, film Early can... Man. Say it again, James. Say it again, James. But we, surely we've all seen the Ardman film Early Man. That that is solid evidence, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Let's watch it again. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can I just? I'll just read the rest of uh, what Mark had to say. Maybe there are pictorial representations or archaeology that suggests such things. I'm tr- prompted to ask this question as I hear often of the travel undertaken by disparate groups to the big meeting places of the time, and wondered if, aside from trade and potential ritual meetups um they may be being human indulge in a bit of competitive lintel pushing or tossing the blue stone or such (laughs) odd question no it's not an odd question it's so perfectly uh on point Uh, certainly if you're talking to uh rupert and i (laughs) yeah 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 well i think uh, there's a gap do you know um there it's written that there are paintings of wrestlers in the Lascaux caves in France. Now, that's 15,300 years old. Now, I have to be honest here. I have read those words, but I have not seen anything in the Lascaux art that makes me look at it and go, yeah, that's wrestlers. Um, Hunters, yes, um, you know, various things. But um, they say they're there. I haven't seen anything that convinces me. Um, apart from that, if you, um, because bearing in mind that if you go back into the Paleolithic, then communities were very small. Uh, when you start coming forwards into periods of time where art was really a significant part, you know, when, when, when life was sufficiently under control that you had enough time to devote yourself to art, then it came so much later, representative, you know, representational art. Uh, so that's really Bronze Age. And you have things like the bull leapers, in, you know, in Minoan art, for mm, example, mm. Um, that, uh, you know, that's early bull 
well, it would have been bullfighting. I'm sure they didn't just dance around with them. Uh, but, you know, we know that the Olympics, um, uh, I can see that I've frozen. No, I've come no, back. No, you haven't. Keep going. Uh, Keep we, going. We, we know that the Olympics uh, started in smaller um, uh you know more regional events before it became the big games and uh any of you that have seen standing with stones you'll know that we think that a number of the sites were used for sports and certainly when you look at some of the big henges uh that they scream arena at you mm. it's very difficult to find evidence uh, in the neolithic um bronze age yes um but neolithic not so much do you do you know of any <laughs> apart from early man james can you think of any actual um, evidence for sport well the absolutely solid evidence no um but i can think of a number of different um objects or um sites uh, that, that could fit into that uh henge sport theory uh, immediately thinking of the carved stone balls um because we, we simply don't know what they were for um it's been long suggested that they could have been some kind of game but they're never found in groups they they have different numbers of bosses so there's no yeah. uniformity to you know roll in a dice to say um but otherwise um you know it, it does make total sense to find them in Scotland because you know Scotland is of course famous for golf so it would make sense um, <laughs> but um, we also get the carved chalk balls um, from some of the flint mining sites um, yes. and causeway enclosure sites hmm. um, whether they were for games or for some ritual activity and a bit of a throwaway but um, it, it seems fairly reasonable um, and yeah. Tapping into your um, arena theory, um, certainly in the Paleolithic, I think it's it's very very sensible to suggest that either young people or hunters practicing would have been engaged in some kind of game or sport just to keep their it's, skills uh, it, home. Exactly, mm. uh, competition uh, is essential. Improving your skills is essential. And I can't imagine human beings, human beings, not doing it. You know, without yeah, exactly. uh, without without competition, it's it's almost a given for me. I, what I like um, Thornborough henges, though, you know, the three uh, massive henges, you know, all, all within uh, half a mile of each other, is the fact is that not far away in Harrogate. You've got the Yorkshire Showground, which you know, if mm -hmm. you can't, it's it's actually also got three large arenas, different sort of shapes and sizes, but it's, it's so you can imagine the same sorts of things going on. I think uh, I think it mark you right on point. This thing about people coming together, people come together at the Yorkshire Showground in Great Yorkshire show, Showground in Harrogate to show off their tractors, to show off their sheep, to show off their cattle. But boy, mm. do they, you know, do they involve themselves in a competition uh, of one sort or another? And I can't imagine that, you know, uh, maybe, uh, you know, and the, the, just what there's there's always clay pigeon shooting isn't there there's not quite the you know the robust yeah, stuff of, the that you get at the rodeo maybe at uh at yorkshire showground but you know, mm. bullfighting uh, yeah. well you know when when you look at the uh the roman um the the <laughs> the roman games the the venati that really were about animal sport the amount of thousands God, literally God thousands of animals that were dispatched in the most disgusting ways just in uh, in a, a, a matter of days that the way that the audience was protected from the wild animals was very henge like there was mm. a ditch and uh uh, and then you you had the separation that was like the berm of a henge uh, before the bank of the seating, very very similar to henge structure, um, and uh, uh, you know as I said, I mean thousands of animals. It's you know that doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, mm. So uh, um, 
Yeah, it's that really. I, I think that we've just carried on, uh, you know, doing what we've always done in history. Yeah. Sibylla just, uh, you misunderstood me, Sibylla, when um, I wasn't saying that representational art is the pinnacle of anything. I'm saying that representational art could have given us evidence for something if it had been a picture that we could recognize of boxes, for example, as opposed to abstract art, which can be beautiful, but doesn't tell you what people were specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, whether they were punching mm -hmm. each other's lights out or running faster than each other. That, that's all I meant by representational art. Yeah. Um, mm. Oh, my Lord. Um, yeah, oh, it's one of those things I remember uh, saying about the Venati and, and the Roman goings on. They were it, depleting North Africa on an industrial scale of oh. wild animals. They, they were so the, voracious and what was going on in those arenas. <laughs> Yeah, the 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 numbers are genuinely chilling, absolutely chilling. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry, I brought it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to bring things Just... back to the world of uh, prehistory, please do, please um, do, Jeff. To, to rang it back <laughs> in from uh, those wasky womans. Um, I I did think your your comment on. Uh, henges being used as a hunting type games ground was interesting in the sense that hunting wild animals from the early Neolithic onwards drops like a stone. Mm. Uh, wild animals are very rarely hunted, so although they do occasionally appear in ditches, you know, deer, boar, the rest of it, mm -hmm. um, was it a case of those wild animals being hunted for a special occasion? Um, mm. Which arguably means that it's not hunting for sustenance, it's hunting for sport or some variation of that um and certainly mm. when you start to look at some of the arrowheads um you know middle neolithic chisel arrowheads um are they particularly lethal um are they for causing wounds are they for crowd spectacle mm. um for hitting animals causing lots of blood um not suggesting yep. that's exactly what they were for but it has well been think of the poor piggies that they were for that think of the poor piggies at durrington walls yeah exactly uh, yes. Yeah. No, take take yeah, your uh, take your point. Yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. It's a very good point. And uh, uh, well, uh, I just I think that you know people being people, I think they would have been doing that. And um, it uh, just we we are an extraordinary creature. We always have been. That we just we're about the most aggressive creature there has ever been. I think you know we do. You know, far more than cats do with with rodents. You know, the, the the way humans kill things just for the pleasure of it is bizarre. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that we would have been doing that for fun throughout history. Mm. Actually, do you know what? Another thing that I'll say yes. here is that we, uh, in the next news compendium, we will be. So you know, the spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Uh, we will be talking about some. Uh, some Bronze Age trousers from China. Yes. And and the thing is that these trousers, the technology in them is astonishing because they're constructed in such a way that you have uh, really flexible parts of the fabric and really rigid parts of the fabric, and they are very clearly for use on horseback. Um, now, when you look at Scythians... On horseback, and uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter which, whichever culture on horseback. If you are being trained to ride a horse so that you can shoot a bow from the back of a horse, you, whatever, how many sports would people have been involved with just f uh, to hone those skills, but for the sheer fun of who does it better? You know, that, it's mm. another thing. There must have been so many different kinds of uh, sporting yeah. events like that. Um, nice pivot to trousers there, Rupert. Hey, <laughs> hey, <laughs> just just doing my job. <laughs> yeah. See you on the next MS advert. 
uh, but it's, it, it's a good one to watch out for. Uh, it'll be uh, coming your way at uh, the end of the month, uh, all being well. I think, guys, it is time to wind up. We, we are approaching 10 o'clock, and we've been at this for uh, nearly two hours. And it's we amazing. We're very for me. grateful that you fact, good people... Uh, we the the people we had a message from hello tim there's tim from australia yeah uh, said hello earlier on and uh uh yeah honestly the fact that you people come from far and wide warms the very cockles of our oh, hearts, hearts. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I'm afraid now is the time to say uh, goodbye. It's been a deep pleasure and, and made all the more special for James being able to uh, join us tonight. Yeah. We must do this yeah. more often. <laughs> we must do this more often. Thanks very much for joining us, James. It's great to see you. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully we'll, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, we'll get to Wales in the flesh in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank you to you. Thank you to you, folk, for being with us. Do stay well. And, um, oh, before we go, I have to say, next month's will be pushed back a week because of my move. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the, the live Q&A in the month of May, uh, I haven't got the date in front of me, but it won't be the first Thursday in, in the month. It will be the second. <laughs> Oh, no, it'll be Q&A. I, I, um, I, I shall schedule it and put a call for questions up um, shortly. Right. Yeah, just in um, case you were attempting to put things in, in your diary. However, yes. with that, I will say uh, ta for now from me. And uh, good from me. And uh, <laughs> goodbye from Mr. Dilly. <laughs> He's probably turned off now. He's <laughs> see you again soon, uh, take folks. Bye, bye, folks, and we'll see you next time. All the best. <laughs>